Hello and welcome to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit professionals and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia, and I am here with Megan Martin, who is who oversees the Arts Council of Greater Lansing. So what, it, oh. I'm sorry, what is that your official title as executive director or is it something yes. else? Okay. Executive yes. director. Nice. Well, I, I sometimes say that I'm executive director slash manage of the manager of the office slash janitor <laughs> slash uh, carpenter slash whatever I'm needed to be that day. <laughs> well, well, that's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, well, narrowing it down to executive director allows you to not have a, like a fold out business card yeah <laughs> just like yeah here you go Recording these are all the stuff. things that i do so um what we start with always is because of the name of the show mission control what is the mission that you control at the arts council awesome yeah so um at the arts council of greater lansing our mission is to support strengthen and promote arts culture and creativity in the capital region um, the capital region being Ingham, Clinton, and Eaton counties um, here in the center of Michigan. And basically what that means is that we find great importance in arts and culture for the livability of our community. And we want to make sure that our individual artists, art students, art teachers, arts organizations, and festivals are all being supported. And we strengthen them through the funding that we, we distribute. So what drew you to being a part of the Arts Council? Why are you here? Um, So I I don't know that anybody that I've ever met has had a direct path into what they're doing. And I'm not unique in that um, I didn't start out in this realm. Um, I always had a vision of working at a nonprofit. And Um, I actually got a degree in journalism and ended up working for the Michigan uh, Press Association, our our state level newspaper association. And um, from there, I actually found out uh, an opportunity with our regional um, planning association. So I was able to do communications and outreach for them and learned about the economic impact and economic planning and things like that, that arts and culture is definitely a part of. And I learned about creative placemaking and how much the Arts Council of Greater Lansing was doing to try and bridge artists into the community to help the economic impact. And before any of that happened, I was raised by an art teacher. I took every possible art class I could take. I took any possible theater or dance or choral class, um, creative writing, anything like that, that was in the realm of the arts when I was in high school and then um, a little bit when I was in college. So I always had a passion for the arts, but I never knew that you could be in a position to support those that wanted artists, uh, artistry to be their career. Um, so when I found out what the Arts Council of Greater Lansing did, I I definitely gravitated to the Arts Council. And um, I, when the position of program manager opened up, uh, to somebody on the staff that manages the grant programs and helps membership with technical assistance, um, I applied for that job and got it. And I was in that position for a few years before I became interim executive director and then became executive director um, in February of 2020. <laughs> I like I the, the preface of I had I got the I officially got the job right before the world exploded. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, well, let's uh, um, talk a little bit about um, the art that you're you're interested in are are you an artist i mean i know you said that you dabbled in performing and fine and all these aspects in your formative years but is there 
is there uh are you are you an actual artist um i would maybe identify more as a creative okay. i definitely hold a, a space in my life for creativity and um choose creative outlets um anything from you know if your friend asks you to go to a ceramics class i'm there you know if you want to go do karaoke count me in if you want to go learn salsa dancing let me put on my dancing shoes that's definitely where i live right now um just for time purposes i i would love to get back into theater and i have definitely some cheerleaders in that uh realm that would like me to get back into theater because i adored being in theater but um I just haven't had the time. And so at some point in my life, there will be when I have less, you know, hockey and lacrosse at, from my kids' sports and, um, you know, everything that I do for the Arts Council. Maybe when I have more time, I'll jump back into that. But right now, I just identify as a creative, I would say. Well, I mean, I, I relate to that because I, uh, I dove back into theater. I did three, three or four, three, three plays maybe um, before. Nice. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, I know that. so I, I can identify with that. It, but what it, it is time consuming. It, there is a lot and um, I've, it's been difficult for me to get back into it after we've come out of the pandemic anyway, but this is not about me, <laughs> but I like, uh, I like also the fact that, um, you you basically described yourself as a as a professional wing person. <laughs> hey, <laughs> do I need a partner? Let's call Megan. Let's get yes. Let's get All right, let's tap that's me awesome. in, coach. <laughs> <laughs> so you went from a program. What 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 entailed being a program director at the Arts Council? Um, so program manager was the position when I had it. And um, now Taylor Hayslett on my team is the program manager, but she's also um, membership and program manager. Um, just anything to do with the programming, like our smarts workshops, um, our grants, we have six grant programs to manage, which is extensive. There's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, welcoming new members and telling people about membership and connecting with our members in our creative mixers, um, just putting together any sort of programming. And when I was program manager, I was managing the Creative Placemaking Summit, which is our annual conference, um, as well as our Creative Exchange, which is another um, professional development opportunity that we do. And managing all of that, I felt like I was doing six jobs in one. So I hired a program assistant once I became uh, executive director, Tabor Vitz, um, so that, that we have a stronger um, capacity for doing all of that because we want to do it to the best of our ability. And um, when I was doing it, I was definitely running myself ragged, trying to keep up with all of it. So it was a really great opportunity to meet all of the artists and you really get more of that one-on-one -on -one because you're sitting down with people and giving them technical assistance, which they're telling you all about what that entails, I should say. I shouldn't assume that that's common knowledge, but we're basically sitting down with the people of the community that want to do projects related to arts and culture, and they want to know how the Arts Council can support them. And if that means leading you to somebody that we know that does accounting in the particular field that you're in, or somebody that wants to do a community project on the other end of what you're doing. Like if the city of Lansing parking office wants a mural on the side of one of their parking garages, do we know a muralist that has like the perfect idea, you know, things like that, that we're able to say, we're connecting dots between the community members that want to do something. And then if you don't know how to apply for a grant, that's perfectly understandable. Not everybody does that in their life. So let us walk you through it and make it super simple. And because we have that program manager position, we're able to be objective and guide somebody through the process and not be part of the review of that process or sorry, of that grant. Um, so we bring in a panel of 
regional experts in the in the area of whatever the grant is and have them kind of review that grant and see how well they did their application. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's awesome because I know that um, I've been part of that review process and it's a really cool process. Yes, um, thank you. And it's awesome that uh, that you have that and you bring in community members to do that. I think that's really key. Um, so what how was the transition um, from program manager to I think you said you were in interim. Mm -hmm to being full-fledged i mean how is that transition was that was that an easy transition because you had already been there for a few years or was it just like a hard pivot um i would say i was in this um i mean the purgatory of interim director is a little bit stressful in its own way because you don't know if you're moving up into the executive director. I was definitely interested in that position. Um, I, but you're in this kind of blissful place where you're not necessarily the one in charge, but you are the one in charge. Your board is the one in charge. So I had the freedom of um, being able to just fix the immediate things that I saw from the programming department and just being able to say, okay, from my perspective, these are some quick things that we can just change right out the gate and with my board support. And then when I got into the executive director role, I was immediately forced to know every, it was, it was amazing because I got to see the, the bigger picture as opposed to just from one angle in the silo that I was in. Mm -hmm. And being in the executive director role, you get to see the bigger picture of the organization. You get to see the the entire organization. And I really enjoyed getting some of those kind of questions answered or those things filled in my mind that I didn't quite get just from being program manager. So I really liked seeing more of the strategic um, planning of the organization and where we were going as a whole. Um, and then, of course, shortly thereafter, I became the executive director of an organization going through a pandemic. So I, I had to quickly um, speed up my training, I guess. <laughs> I had gone through some serious, very rigorous leadership training in my time, and nothing prepared me for this. But I think I was able to kind of lean on what I was seeing from others and create the plans for what if, you know, what if this only lasts a couple weeks? What if this lasts a couple months and so forth? And I was quickly able to say, okay, we need to move Arts Night out into something else. We have to cancel our entire programming for anything in person, but how can we recreate that digitally? How can we still stay engaged? How are my, how's my team gonna be safe? I had fortunately in the interim role, I had turned a lot of our programs, um, our computer programs into a remote access. So fortunately we were pretty prepared for that, but. It was massively challenging, as I think anybody could say in any position. But since then, I've just been kind of like everybody else, playing whack-a-mole and dodging the problems as they come. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think your your fellow executive directors would be like nodding their heads right now on that one. Absolutely, whack-a-mole. I think is a really good description of. Maybe that's maybe that's what you should uh, have as your job description. Whack a mole. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. So whack a mole pro. <laughs> yeah, whack a mole pro. And so, um, well, talking about the transition, um, you had the fortunate uh, position to have been under Debbie Mykula, who mm -hmm. really took the Arts Council to a different phase. Um, 
And so, but that could also be some big shoes to fill. What did you take mm -hmm. away from um, working with her and how are you putting your spin on what was established? I think I, I was very fortunate that um, Debbie and I worked together in tandem for, she brought me along to a lot of her meetings. She brought me along to conferences and speaking engagements. And she also gave me the opportunity to take ownership of being the speaker at certain speaking engagements. And that was, I think, integral to me taking on this role and feeling comfortable. I was already doing interviews. I was already running a conference where I had to be the spokesperson for our organization. And she really gave me the opportunity to put me in a leadership role and let me get comfortable in that before putting before she recommended me for this role. And I think what I had with Debbie was that she and I had a lot of um, a lot of interest in creative placemaking and really understanding kind of the why not just, okay, we're going to do this because creative placemaking is our thing. You know, that's something that I think she really spearheaded for the organization is that our board of directors said, you know, creative placemaking is the economic development term for what artists are doing. So we need to be there for that conversation. And I think she really built it so that we were the leaders in the region that could discuss creative placemaking in any meeting and get us to talking to people that the Arts Council has never talked to before and be the voice for people that um, aren't necessarily going to those meetings or don't have time to go to those meetings, that we can sit in at chamber, Lansing Regional Chamber of Commerce meetings or um, go to Lansing Rotary and talk to them about it. And I think she really taught me that we have a place in the room and we need to be a respected voice in the room as opposed to some of the ways that people view arts and cultural um, industry leaders. Like it's a, it's an added benefit that we, we, we want the world to consider it critical that we have arts and culture, that it's not an afterthought. And I think she really empowered me to take ownership of a lot of that so that when I became interim executive director, I had so much of that training already. It was really being able to speak to people about what we're doing and this, the organizational stuff. I, I don't think anything could have prepared me for, you know, all that it takes to be an executive director and manage a staff and manage um, all of the documentation that it takes to be a nonprofit. But Fortunately, I had worked with um, Don and Taylor, who were and Ryan, who worked there at the time uh, with Debbie, and I'd been working with them for a few years at that point. So I was really comfortable switching into that role and leading them. Now you've brought up creative placemaking a lot. Um, <laughs> I do that sometimes. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that it's it's become a crucial facet of what the Arts Council does. But could you explain? Explain a little bit more about what creative placemaking really is and what, I mean, you touched on it a little bit, but yeah. what it really is and how arts are such a crucial part. Yeah. Um, so placemaking, it, I'll start with that because there's a difference between placemaking and creative placemaking. Placemaking or placekeeping is a matter of taking those spaces where people are congregating already. For instance, in Lansing, we had what is now Rotary Park, and it didn't look like that five, 10 years ago. But we knew that there was opportunity to take that space where people are naturally coming from the businesses around there and congregating and taking their lunch break there and things like that. So how about we put in some benches? How about we put in some um, awnings? How about we put in this fire pit? You know, those are some placemaking things where we recognize where people want to congregate outside and have community moments. And creative placemaking is looking at 
the treescape there and saying, what if we had dripping lights that came down in an artistic fashion? What if we had a sculpture added there? What if we had um, performances there? What if we had um, murals under the bridge? What if we had um, the mosaic tile installation on the side of the bridge? That's creative placemaking. That's taking the spaces that already exist where people want to congregate and have activity and putting artists into the conversation and saying, we want you to lead and tell us how we can represent the community that lives here in an artistic way. Um, and so what we do is try and facilitate that in our annual conference that happens in October, the Creative Placemaking Summit is where we're bringing in national and international leaders, as well as local and state level leaders to talk about creative placemaking or placekeeping, um, something that we wanna make sure that we're respecting the community. So we talk to people that are doing the work there and making sure that there's um, uh, inclusivity when you're talking to people about their projects. And so we learn about the best practices as well as get some ideas through case studies about what other people are doing. So it's we, we have grants for creative placemaking. We really put a lot into just the impact that it can have. And we've seen over the past 10 years just how much people have grasped onto it. So we keep going. Nice, nice. I think that that's uh, one of the biggest things coming out of the pandemic um, is the fact that you have, I know that you've had these grants before, but it's really, um, I think that it's really starting to take off uh, a little bit more with people understanding how crucial it is to have an outdoor space or congregative space and uh, enjoy that. Um, and so speaking of coming out of the pandemic or being within that, I'm not going to dwell on it too much because, uh, but during that time was another difficult situation um, in which you are a membership-based organization. Mm -hmm. How how difficult is it to run a membership-based organization in today's time? It's, I will say it's um, challenging for the sense of we have a membership because we want to help people and create a community and if you aren't connected through that membership title, then it's much harder to stay connected. And that's why we, during the pandemic, we created the pay what you can membership because we didn't wanna lose that membership. We didn't wanna lose the support that we were trying to give. Um, so we really said, hey, individual artist or small arts or organization, if, you, if this is a barrier to you staying a member, you know, we'll take that away from you and just pay what you can. And it was really a matter of you want, you know, we were learning a lot about how we could help people through that crisis. And we were doing a lot of research on what other arts and cultural um, administrators were doing from our national level. And we were also finding support, like um, we were awarded a grant from the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, to get a build a whole new grant program using um, $200,000. So as we lose members, because they, it's just not a priority in their heads, you know, I get that entirely. I probably fell off a few memberships myself, who knows, but I get why our memberships went down, but it's it can be kind of uh, an extra task for us to just reach out and tell people, you know, we're here for you. We want to help you. And the best way for us to stay connected is if you if you connect with us and you be part of that community so that we know what you're doing and how we can help. But it's it's I love having a membership. I always I've been a part of membership organizations before, and it's really um, you get to kind of track the progress of what people are doing and you get to see what they're doing in their day to day, which is which is awesome. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that's kind of your background. You went from the MPA to the, mm -hmm. to Tri County, and 
Um, yeah, and it's about tracking what your constituents are doing, and I think yeah. that's uh, that's pretty because that get that's about building community as well. Um, yeah. Anyway, so talk to me about what has been the biggest surprise for you in this role since you officially got the role of February in February of 2020. <laughs> What was the biggest surprise? And we're what not still it? talking about the pandemic. Yep, that was a bit of a shocker um, <laughs> because I had quite a few plans of, um, you know, what are we get? How are we going to build our programming? And, you know, I was going to events every other night and still trying to, you know, live my life at home. And then like all of a sudden everything stopped and I was like, hold up. Everything I know about this is different. Um, I think, I don't know. I think I had a pretty good ease into the position, honestly, being program manager and then being interim director and then being um, executive director. It really, I had kind of a nice gradual ease into it. And I have such a great team and I will shout from the rooftops how awesome they are. They've really gotten me through a lot. Um, and so I don't know the biggest, I think the biggest change for me or the biggest surprise, I suppose, is that, um, and this of course occurred to me in the middle of like a training session for something and was in talking to people that aren't executive directors, but they're also, they have roles in arts and cultural organizations. And they're talking about boundaries and they're talking about, you know, as the program manager, let's say, I just make sure that I'm not answering calls after such and such time. And I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. You know, I'm setting boundaries as far as, you know, I don't friend people on social media. And it occurred to me that being executive director, you're responsible for an organization 24 seven, whether you want to shut off or not. It doesn't matter if I'm on vacation or if I'm sleeping, I'm still responsible if I get a phone call and that's 24 seven. That's not just, you know, I can't have those kind of boundaries. I can set certain boundaries, but that was something I don't think anybody could prepare me for. And it's not just because that's what people are asking of me. It's because I feel that in, in me that it's my responsibility to make sure that this organization is taken care of. It has a legacy of 55 years almost, and it's in my hands right now. So I need to make sure that I'm showing up for it 24 seven. And that's something I don't think anybody could have prepared me for. Um, so yeah, I'd say that was the biggest surprise for me. Hmm. I'm well, sure you can identify with some of that, Paul. <laughs> oh, like all of it? All of it? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, well, let's uh, let's segue. That's a good segue when you're speaking of boundaries to mm -hmm. uh, the last question. And the last question is, what do you do to escape? What, 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 what things do you gravitate to just to get your mind in a different place for a little while? Audiobooks. Okay. I love listening to audiobooks. Um, I love journaling, um, either productive journaling or creative journaling. Um, listening to podcasts, watching movies. Um, I actually adore being a sports mom. So I go out of town with my kiddo for tournaments and I go watch her at practices and stuff. So that definitely helps. Um, but I would say my number one is like podcasts and audiobooks. Any 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 uh, any favorites? Other than other than this one? Yeah, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, so I just finished um, The Spare by Prince Harry. Oh, okay. Um, that was really beautifully written. And I really enjoyed that. That brought me into like a Zen, even though there are some really tough topics that he goes through and really big um, familial struggles. Um, it was actually really, really beautifully written. Um, and so I really enjoyed that. Um, 
I love movies. I just watched um, The Imitation Game yesterday mm. with Benedict Cumberbatch and Kira Knightley. Good movie. Um, have you seen that one mm -hmm. about um, um, Alan Turing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That one was excellent. Um, anything by Brene Brown and Glennon or Glennon Doyle podcast or book or otherwise, I'm, I'm a big fan because they, they hit you right to the core and tell you, you know, it's okay to not be okay sometimes. We can do hard things. Fair enough. So yeah. how can people get a hold of you and find out what the Arts Council is up to? So um, anybody can contact me. I'm best through email. I mean, I'm a millennial. I don't answer my phone if I don't have to, but <laughs> I'm best through email. No, I do answer the phone. Um at Megan at LansingArts.org, or you can go to our website and find everybody's information at LansingArts.org. Um, and yeah, we have all sorts of goodies on there, like connections to our LansingPlacemakers.org, where you can find out about the Creative Placemaking Summit um, or any of our other activities like Arts Night Out and grants. Great. Well, thank you, Megan, for being on the show. It was really cool to hear your story and your journey. Um, to where we are today. Really appreciate you being being on this. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's always fun to chat with you, Paul. <laughs> well, that's good because you had an half hour to do it. You got it all out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thank you all for once again taking some time to listen to our program. And don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple weeks. And if there's someone that you know of that you would like to hear about on their journey, please email us at Mission Control at introduce.com and if this is your first time here please subscribe on youtube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review thank you again very much and catch us next time in the control center